I can get my books. And maybe. we're live. <laughs> That's the like, perfect yeah. moment to be moving your camera. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, does it say live for you, I'm assuming? Yes, it does. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, hello. Everybody should know who I am already. So I won't introduce myself, but this is my lovely friend, Heather, if you would like to give us the elevator pitch for your existence. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I have uh, my PhD in Shakespearean studies and early modern drama. So this was something that really excited me. Um, right now I teach at Purdue. I teach writing and composition at Purdue and I have three crazy kids that keep me very busy and I'm on bookstagram and I like to read. So that's <laughs> my existence in a nutshell, I guess. And you decided to take on some, some homework for funsies. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I actually was like really excited to have homework again because it's been so long since I've had homework because I'm just. Instead of just grading it, you get to do it. <laughs> I was actually excited about it. I'm a I was so excited when like because we've talked for a few years now and I had no idea that you would like not only were just kind of generally into Shakespeare you're like you're like certified into Shakespeare <laughs> I have a degree that proves I'm certified exactly. <laughs> so I was super excited to find somebody who as I said before out nerds me on Shakespeare yeah, you can when show I was me watching up. two plays this week, I would like pause it and like take notes and like think about it and then message you and then start it again. And my mom is like, it's taking you hours to watch the plays. So I was like, I know, because I need to experience them. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to pick apart. That's the thing. Well, I feel like with Shakespeare, well, for me anyway, who enjoys Shakespeare, I think Shakespeare can be relatively casually enjoyed, like just, mm -hmm. you know, just to watch it and be like, oh, it's good. And like, you know, a lot of it flew by you, but like generally and some parts stuck out to you. But it's also like the more you go back and like maybe see the play again and then maybe read the play. And then after having read it, then watch it again. And like, it's just like, you know, layers and layers of unearthing meaning and, and et cetera, et cetera. But like, I feel like you don't have to do that to enjoy it. It can be like casually enjoyed, but yeah. No, yeah, I agree. And I think that what I love about plays and why I did early modern drama instead of, you know, poetry was because I love the way that performance changes the way that we understand it and it emphasizes certain themes and it can totally change your experience with a play and your understanding of it. And that's what I love about drama. It feels like a living, breathing organism that can constantly be changing. And that's why I love like retellings and reimaginings and, uh, and just watching plays anyway. So well, I always tell people like who are starting out with Shakespeare that it was intended to be experienced as a play. So yeah. like, if you can, I advise you to watch it first. And unlike a book where you're like, well, watch the movie first and then read the book. We're like, no, but with a play, yeah. Like it was meant to be performed. So mm -hmm. like, it's, I feel like you'll be able to sink your teeth into it better if you've seen it at least once and then yeah. to go back and read it. And cause you're not going to catch everything if you just see a play, plus they cut stuff out and interpret it and whatever, but you, it was meant to be performed. So it's not right. like, it's not like with movies and books. Yeah. And I think that people learn about Shakespeare's time and the the history of drama wrong. Like, I think a lot of people learn in high school, oh, they didn't have anything on the stage. It was just them. And like, they just like spoke poetry. And I feel like that's what I learned in high school. And then when I started studying drama and studying the history of it, it's like, no, these things were built to be spectacles. They had yeah. fake blood. They had their own kind of lighting. Um, and not all of these were the Marvel movies of their day. <laughs> yes, they were. Like, and each play was written for the way that the playhouse was constructed. And so I think that we have to remember that these also have constraints insofar as like even the buildings that they were meant to be performed in. So like Macbeth was not written for the globe. It was written for an indoor theater that was very dark. And so it was supposed to be creepy and very, it was supposed to feel claustrophobic. That's what mm -hmm. Shakespeare was like going for because that was the theater that it was meant for so whereas like the tempest it was going for the new technology of the time so it was one of it was like you know one of the more it was the avatar of its day <laughs> <laughs> and so he had like the spirits and the thunder and the lightning because he was trying to utilize all of the things that the theater had and so you have to see that perform because you don't get that when you read the page so. yeah when you just read it you're like well that was real quick like i, I guess some stuff happened but <laughs> it's actually really long when you perf when everyone's yeah. performing all of the stuff. <laughs> and then it was supposed to be a m musical and a comedy and it, like even a tragedy was supposed to 
you know, have those musical and comedic moments. Like music was such a huge part of the theater back then. And we just don't get that musicality when we're just reading it on the page. It just says, sings a song. <laughs> yeah. And I do, I mean, like, I feel like now I see it more, but I feel like for a time when people adapted Shakespeare for the stage or film, they would cut out any of the mm -hmm. singing and music. And I love when they do put that in still because like it's it was there for a reason. <laughs> And that's why I love um, Romeo plus Juliet, Baz Luhrmann's version of it. Uh, it's like my fav one of my favorite Shakespeare retellings because he includes modern music as a way to show, to make modern audiences feel what they would have felt. So he doesn't use the kind of music they were using, but he still uses music very intentionally. And I really like his production. And he's like very good at making it a spectacle. Like I haven't actually seen that one because I don't love Baz Lerman, but I know that that was like the, in the theory behind why they did a Knight's Tale the way they did because they were like, Knights were basically rock stars of their day. So to get you to love like or to, to feel the way that people would have felt back then, like we're gonna mm -hmm. put rock music in and make them be cool. And like, I don't know if it really translated to be that, I love the movie anyway, but like that was kind of what they said they were going for. It's the perfect movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when they said that, I was like, oh, that makes sense. I don't know if you achieved that, but like, I like it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're talking about, oh no, I did this. So Macbeth and the Tempest and oh their God. respective retellings, <laughs> Hagseed and Macbeth. <laughs> I just want to, so like, I, maybe we'll talk about it chronologically because we did Tempest first when we read it or we can mix it up. I don't know. It's chaos. But I was just like going to say that, spoilers, we hated Macbeth, the retelling. And I just, I have I, feelings. can I just say it only just occurred to me that because we kind of accused it of being low effort. The title is low effort. Yeah. <laughs> Macbeth. <laughs> so anyway, then we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, we enjoyed the Tempest and Hag Seed. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know. I think yeah, I know you're a big, big fan of Macbeth. How familiar and into The Tempest were you before we, we did this? I had read it once a while ago, but um, I was way more into his tragedies and his histories. <laughs> so, like, I could talk about Henry V and Macbeth and Hamlet all day. So I had, uh, I, I had read it once and have, like, learned about it once, but it was never in my, like, wheelhouse of things, so... But that's why I really liked what Margaret Atwood did. Like she really tried to make her retelling an obvious um, interaction like with the play. Like she wanted you to understand the play after reading her book. So I liked that about it. Yeah, I mean, after we, now this morning actually, so we had <laughs> already read it a while ago. Um, I was looking up some interviews with her um, about Hagseed, mainly to like see if we were right in in why she called it Hagseed, why we thought she okay. called it Hagseed, to see if there's any confirmation of that anywhere. But I mean, in any case, I mean, she kind of talked about that, how like when they, uh, Hogarth Shakespeare, the project, which we haven't actually really talked about what that project is, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory. They, they asked famous authors to retell Shakespeare plays and they asked her which one she'd want to retell and her first choice was The Tempest. Um, so, which I wouldn't, <laughs> I was like, that, that would never be my first choice, but um she was saying how she loved how it's, you know, most overtly out of all of his plays, a play about plays, about mm -hmm. directing, about acting, about all of that, which it really is. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I know she has a master class. I have not taken any master classes, but I bet hers is amazing. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so it was, uh, it was interesting seeing kind of like why that play in the first place appealed to her and then her stress when she like, she was excited. Okay, she got this project and now she reads yeah. The Tempest again and she's like, okay. And then rereads the Tempest again, and it's like, how am I going to make this a modern thing? Why did I sign up for this? There's just no way to make this work in the modern day. This is craziness. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I think she pulled it off. I I think so too, and I think she did really smart. She made the the the, the changes that she made. I thought were really smart. Are we allowed to give like spoilers in this chat? Is that like? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, if, whenever I've done chats that are just about one book, I'll maybe do like the beginning be a little spoiler free, and but we're doing two in basically four books, so it's gonna be spoilers <laughs> sprinkled throughout. So just and if you're yeah. worried about Shakespeare spoilers, well, he's been dead long enough. <laughs> you should have read it. That's that's, like, that's kind of the thing too, like with a retelling you like know yeah. a lot of the framework going into it. And so you Oh have yeah, and then the question is always like, when something's gonna happen, you're like, are they gonna do exactly what the play did? Or are they gonna change it? Like, that's really the only like 
mystery left. Yeah. And I found that I was both like snobbish about changes and like disappointed when it wasn't changed enough. Like, I feel like I am a person who, uh, <laughs> yes yeah like if you don't know how Macbeth ends like you know yeah I mean I think I said in a video recently where I was like talking about Romeo and Juliet for some reason I don't know why because I haven't read it recently but I was like spoilers Romeo and Juliet they kill themselves at the end <laughs> so all of you people who compare your relationship to Romeo and Juliet maybe don't <laughs> I think yeah. you're 13 years old and took a roofie from a priest <laughs> <laughs> makes sense makes makes sense but yeah i really liked in hag seed about like you know the the great thing about the tempest is all of those magical elements mm -hmm. um, and so i kind of wondered what she was going to do with that like how do you do a modern retelling with all of the magical elements and so i think it's interesting that he, she she ended up like killing off the um miranda character mm -hmm. really and then she like her her ghost becomes like a specter that haunts um mm -hmm. prosperos what's his name in the book <laughs> i keep calling him Felix. Felix, yeah right yeah something like that i just called him prospero in my head and like never corrected it myself even though like the book doesn't call him that yeah it's Felix. But I like felt like it was grief and trauma that ended up being the thing that was haunting him. Not like real mm -hmm. ghosts and not real spirits, but like the grief that he carried with him his whole life of his mm -hmm. dead. Well, I mean, like Shakespeare already deals a lot with madness, but then also does include like supernatural or mm -hmm. magical things. Whereas with the more modern, either adaptations of the actual plays or interpretations as in retellings, it's that's, I think a lot of the time the way that they get around having something supernatural is just make it even more about madness. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Where some of, some of the stuff Shakespeare writes is, I mean, Macbeth is going mad, but yeah. and Ophelia goes mad. And like that, that, that is what's happening there. But a lot of the time when there are characters who are seeing, you know, fairies and ghosts and whatever, like more modern interpretations will be like, nope, that's just more madness. They're not really <laughs> seeing those things. <laughs> Yeah, and I think she kept a good balance here because it wasn't that Felix was mad. It was just that he was grieving. He was a grieving person who... He's arguably mad. He's kind yeah. of interacting with her, her ghost a bit, literally. In a stable and healthy place. <laughs> so that's very true. But, you know... I mean, I he's seeing Miranda almost the way that Macbeth sees Banquo. Yes, but in like a... It's not sanity. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not sanity. And, you know, that whole, like, the, the kind of very long game revenge that he plays is even, like, <laughs> more complicated than, like, Prospero's real. Yeah. Well, I mean, it kind of, like, uh, honestly, Prospero's is, like, just as much of an arguably a longer game in terms of years. It's just we start out already, like, we fast forwarded to that part, whereas with Hagseed, we... We, well, we technically did start out at the end where like their mid uh, play or like in the middle of being in their Tempest basically. Um, but, and then we jump back and then we kind of more experience like that length of time, which mm. is a really long amount of time. It is again, pointing towards insanity to be <laughs> doing this for that long. Cause I mean, I understand getting like really dramatic and bitter right after getting also like, I don't know if we need to explain what hag seed is about it's about a theater director who basically gets pushed out of his position and then instead of like instead of kings and princes and dukes it's a theater director getting pushed out of his job mm -hmm. and then he was about to put on the tempest and kind of in honor of his dead wife and dead daughter because he named his daughter miranda and there's a miranda in the tempest and he's like gonna be did he cast himself as prospero mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought so. So he was kind of like, this was going to be a way to like, like in memoriam. And then they like fire him before they even put on the play. And he's really bitter at everybody who did this to him. So he like goes and lives as a hermit off the grid for nine years and then takes a job uh, teaching Shakespeare to like prison inmates and gets them to put on plays. And his long game is to like use the plays to bring back his now nemeses and like freak them out and like. Basically, do what Prospero like, does in too. the like his nemesis is like now in politics went from like theater director to politics because that's usually how it goes. 
maybe in Canada because <laughs> it takes place in Canada. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was, and I think that's what the hard part about these retellings is that it's trying to fit in a framework, and like so sometimes you have to make those leaps with those characters even though it doesn't always like they're telling a different story and so sometimes in telling that different story it doesn't always like match up with the kind of forced structure of the play so i mean the I structure I had, though forced was less forced than Macbeth, mm -hmm. but we'll get there <laughs> but um well, talk about not starting in the middle of the action i mean you have to go quite a bit into Macbeth to even get to the start of the play. And I get that he was trying to like build up a backstory in the same way that Hagsey does, but he does it so slowly. <laughs> it's unnecessary. There's a lot of things in Joan Nesbo's Macbeth that are unnecessary, but again, <laughs> we'll get there. Like the um, whole, I'm gonna just go on a mini rant because I can't hold it in any longer. The whole point of Macbeth, it is one of Shakespeare's shorter plays and the scenes are all very short and very quick. Like the whole point of Macbeth is that it's this inevitability of time, like coming up that you're coming up against. And this way that it keeps pushing down on it. I really like the RSC production we watched with Christopher Eccleston because they have a timer in the background counting down to when he's going to die to emphasize this like this time that's like coming up. It's almost time. And time's mentioned a lot in the play. It's supposed to be fast paced and suspenseful and scary. And this is the longest Hogarth, like, like how could you take one of his shortest plays about time and make it long and unwieldy? It makes me so mad. I'm like, did you read the play and understand it? Like, and then he gives it hundreds of pages of backstory that just kind of kill the moment where he decides to kill Duncan. I don't know. Yeah, they, I mean, if anything, the backstory contradicts the hype of relationships that are in the play. <laughs> Instead of like being like it's long, but it's worth it. No, it's long, and that's what ruined it. Not just yeah. being long, but like the stuff you added in doesn't make it's sense. Of motivations that don't make sense. So mm -hmm. for anybody who doesn't know, the the Nesbo Macbeth basically makes it about like police officers mm -hmm. and like it's a crime and, thriller. Yeah, and it's like a police officer hierarchy where Macbeth becomes like the head of organized crime. So like they kill. Duncan to like so that he's like head of the police, which I can't remember what the name is anymore. But as you oh, pointed out, the chief out, commissioner, yeah, something like that. But as you pointed out, that's not how that works. Say, you know? Like as much as we were like just laughing about how in Hag Seed the our like our director goes into politics, and you're like, ah. but I mean that's more believable than like I am going to kill the police commissioner so that I then become police commissioner, but then my best friend's children will be the heirs truly and will for generations be police commissioners. <laughs> like, that's not how it works. <sighs> and like, they're setting up all of these. And I think that what he's doing, it's very like police thriller motivations where it's like, you know, people with like good intentions, like they want to fix things, but then, you know, really everybody is just bad. Like Macduff is bad. Like there's no, there's nobody who's working in opposition to Macbeth. Like again, the play Macbeth <laughs> is about oppositions and about opposites. Like over and over again, you have this list of opposites. It's supposed to be about like two opposites kind of working to, like and how they work together and how they're in contradiction. But in this play, he's like, no, everyone's just horrible. And it's just like one person like trying to one up another person. Like it doesn't. And I, I mean, I didn't finish it. You did. I so you say, like, I'm like, honestly like, like I, I, for your sake, as your friend, I don't want you to finish it, but so that you can be salty with me, I want you to have finished it because you would be even angrier than I am about what was done with Lady Macbeth. <laughs> Good morning. Can you look up the summary because uh, I am most seriously displeased. <laughs> <laughs> I just and like and then to make Macduff like this wife like he's cheating on his wife he doesn't really hate his family it like takes away again what like the whole thrust of the tragedy in the play like it just everything every choice he makes just takes away what the tragedy was trying to do and well, it was really he gets Banquo to be basically in on it and to help him with the killing I'm like this is just a whole other thing now that is not it's just the Macbeths. Mr. Yeah. and Mrs. <laughs> do this. 
And like, I just, and like for Lady, like her motivations are even weird. Cause it's like the whole point, why I love Lady Macbeth and Macbeth in the play is because she loves the idea of being a partner in something. It's this idea of like a woman finally getting power, you know, that like, it doesn't happen. Like a woman being a partner in something is not something that always happened, you know? So like they were in love and like doing this together. And I just, I feel like the, again, the book just <laughs> ruins that. I don't know. Uh, someone asked what happened to Lady yeah, I was gonna say. So Lady Macbeth. So in the first place, we hate the fact that like a lot of what is done to make this modern is to make women all like prostitutes. prostitutes and which, like, that. <laughs> like, of course, of course. But anyway, so she is the, I guess, formerly a prostitute, but she's like, she just owns this casino now or this, I think it's a casino and a brothel, but anyway, she's yeah. a steady, and her name is Lady, um, and she's the girl, steady girlfriend of Macbeth, and so instead of going mad over killing Duncan, which is what causes Lady Macbeth to go mad, is realizing that she's like, you know, it's guilt over murder, they keep teasing and then finally reveal that you know how okay so in the play she makes reference to like uh the commitment to this issue and and when she's first telling him to do it how like she would take her own child and like dash its brains out or whatever you know in order to you know you know what i mean <laughs> like yeah. that part so in the play if i had promised you to do that i would have fulfilled that promise so you but she specifically uses the imagery of a baby and killing a baby well is- in this guy who literally copy pasted macbeth and nothing deeper she literally killed a baby when she was like before she ever met Macbeth because her dad raped her and oh, she was pregnant and then she killed the baby and she's been like this whole time she's like well I did what I had to do and blah 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 but now like the guilt over it is too much and she goes Lala and then she kind of comes out of being Lala but while being Lala she kind of says stuff to some servant of Hecate and Hecate is a drug dealer by the way for those yeah, people yeah. watching. <laughs> To make the goddess of witchcraft a man in your retelling, I have choice words for you. Right, Mr. but so back to Lady M. That is so nice. <laughs> she goes la la and basically kills herself over like guilt over having killed her baby back, way back before Macbeth was in her life. So like it has almost nothing to do with what just happened because you know what I mean? Like I'm just like, well, this Which happened is- a while ago. And also, <laughs> why? Are you literally doing a killing of a baby when, like, yes, Shakespeare used that imagery at one point, but did you think she really, like, <laughs> that's what he meant? Because he didn't. And, like, what makes me, again, I'm just, like, so mad, it feels like a misreading of the play. The reason, part of the reason, and I, there's lots of reasons why Lady Macbeth goes mad, but part of it is because Macbeth stops including her in his plans. Like, the whole point of them was to do it together. And so she, like, in one of, things that Shakespeare likes to do with like lovers is to have them complete lines together. Like a, um, Oh my gosh, I'm losing that. <laughs> you know, like his iambic pentameter lines. Oh, I really <laughs> didn't know what you were trying to say. <laughs> yeah, I was like, this is the five feet. Do you see what I'm doing? Uh, so he has them complete lines. And so in the beginning of the play, him and Lady Macbeth are constantly completing each other's lines. They complete these iambic pentameters together. And at and towards the end of the play, he starts to just become, you know, he goes crazy and he does things alone and with hired murderers and all of that kind of stuff. So part of the reason why she goes crazy is because he's left her behind and is not including her anymore. So to make it about like, and there is like, I feel like it's a very mass male reading of the play because a lot of male. All of it was not just to what he did to Lady M, but. Yeah. The whole thing is a very like, I will make it police commissioners and like make all the women prostitutes and blah, blah, blah. Well, and so a lot of male academics think that like maybe she had lost a baby and like that is what made her monstrous. Like she had a miscarriage or a stillborn or something, which I mean, I guess it could be, it like explains why they don't have kids, but to make her madness all about that just feels like it's a very, I don't know, a sexist reading of her character because it just minimizes her to like her mother, you know, like to her ability to have a mother or not. And that just makes me really mad. And like part of the other thing is that the whole idea about Macbeth is that both characters ask, you know, the fates or whatever to be unsexed. And a lot of like 
you know, a lot of people read that as like Lady Macbeth asking to be a man, but that's not really it either because Macbeth does it too. Like a lot of, like, I think that when they're both asking that they're asking to become less human. It's not about being less, you know, less of a woman or less of a man. It's about in order to do these evil deeds, they have to become like inhuman, you know? And so, so then in like Macbeth's book, he makes all of the women prostitutes and makes them like more feminine. And like, to me, it just really, again, it's, it's sexist. Let's just call it what I think. Even if like it had, if he had done this thing where like, yeah, she was abused and she killed a baby and whatever. And that's part of like, what's generally made her have uh, like unstable mental health uh, before all this started fine. But like, it's not really done where this new murder has triggered her and now she feels like a murderess twice over. It's right. not that. It's just that this is coming back to haunt her and she, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'm like, this has nothing to do with any of this. What is this? Why is this here? <laughs> well, to make like the witches prostitutes and like it, we talked about this. One of the witches is like, we think possibly a trans woman because people are like always questioning like whether or not it's actually like she's actually a woman which feels super transphobic and like even to do that and like make you know her a witch just feels like it's trying to well also like it just there that's one of the trickiest things about Macbeth if you're going to try to make it like a super realistic modern thing is like how are you going to do the witches and the ghosts and stuff and not make it not make them prostitutes (laughs) but it's just like taking like okay find their prostitutes but just that whole setup of like them prostitutes coming to him and giving him prophecies you're like what (laughs) how what why and the fact that like I guess Hecate directed them to like but for why? <laughs> this makes no sense. No, no, it doesn't. And like, and then to like, basically, Macbeth's also a drug addict because of course he is. And so like, that's part of the reason why he goes mad too, because he's like an addict and I, it's just trying to do too much. And I think what, what really bothers me too, is that it's supposed to be like scary. Like it, the whole point of the witches and things like that in the play is again, that the space of the theater was supposed to be dark and scary and creepy and he doesn't do any of that. He doesn't give any vibe to that. It's just like the world is a terrible. Well, also, okay, there's this whole so like Macbeth and Macduff aren't like besties in the play. There's not like an immense amount of like this. It, this turns into like a Edmund Dantes versus Fernand Mondego situation yeah. in this version, where at the end, when once again, we had to literally, you don't have to put everything that's in the play in here in some form. So having that whole thing about him not being born of a woman and have him be like ripped out of a womb early, that's in there. And he tells Macbeth this because like, we had literal prophecies from prostitutes that had to be explained. So he tells Macbeth that, you know, that, oh no, like he was, you know, cut out of his mom's womb when she was murdered or whatever before he was born. So great. But also the fact that they were like best friends in an orphanage and they kind of grew apart. And when Macbeth is now this like final showdown with him and Mc, Duff, or Duff, not Muck Duff. Every time Duff was drinking a beer, I wanted to laugh because Simpsons. But, yeah. um, <laughs> uh, so he doesn't want to kill Macbeth. He's going to like take him in and properly, you know, arrest him and make him face justice for what he's done because that's the thing to do. And Macbeth goads him into killing him by being like, come on, you know, you want to kill me after, you know, like what I did, you know, you want to, you know, you want to. And like basically talks him into it until like finally Duff kills him. Um, But like that whole thing, I was just like, that's just like not the vibe of the end of Macbeth. It's not Macbeth goading his best friend from forever ago to kill him, which like, again, doesn't work because like the way that Macbeth convinces Duff to kill him is like by harping on all the horrible things that Macbeth did, i.e. kill his family. Right. And like to go back to circle back to that, yeah, Macbeth, you seriously killed your best friend's family yeah. over this? Like when it just does not work when you make yeah. them best friends. <laughs> So don't read this one. <laughs> don't read this one. Like I, I thought maybe one star was too harsh, but the more I think about it, nah. This just no just why i was thinking also about so like uh, a retelling and like the spectrum of it being good or not what makes a retelling work and a retelling like the best of all possible worlds is when it works both as a glorious like reference and interpretation of the text but also completely stands on its own and you could not know it's a retelling and enjoy it like that's like a perfect book then in the middle you have 
works really well as a retelling, but doesn't really stand on its own or stands on its own really well, but not so good as a retelling. And then you have works on neither front. It's neither a good book nor a good retelling. And that's where Macbeth is. <laughs> maybe and I think part of the problem is that this is not my genre I do not go to like police thrillers okay, but I don't think that Macbeth is Joe Nesbo's genre <laughs> <laughs> so I just I feel like they should have gotten like a horror writer to do it you know oh, like somebody who could play with the idea because I think like that's what horror does really well like that whole horror genre is about bending um you know, your perception of what is real. And so I feel like someone who was used to that could have done this instead of trying to make it this real gritty. Like it felt like, you know, I'm doing a gritty retelling of Macbeth, but it's already, it's already there's so much death. It's already gritty and crazy. You don't need to try and make it more gritty and crazy. And again, like Duff is supposed to work as a contradiction to Macbeth. And so then to make him like, not as good. Like, I mean, he, they set him up. Like, the, we meet Duff first, I think, in this book. And it's about, like, his desire to get, like, the gang leader or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, they could have had Steve. Yeah, the fact that, like, in the very beginning, we set up this kind of, like, animosity thing between them where, like, he has purposely cut Macbeth out and he wants to capture this drug dealer on his own. And even though Macbeth is head of SWAT, and SWAT arguably should be there. He purposely right. requested that SWAT not be there because he wanted to do it himself. And now he's seeing that actually there's a lot more dudes and he really should have called SWAT. Well, good thing Macbeth showed up anyway and SWAT is there and he's like, Rrr. but I'm like, what is this? This is like, what is this rivalry? Like, this is not from Macbeth. What is this? <laughs> right. And then like Duff then like kills the kid, the kid gang member. Uh, just because Duff is also crazy and he's like cheating on his wife and he's like a horrible person. And it's like, this does not work for how the play is <laughs> supposed to work. Like it's not, he's not supposed to be. So like, you just have no, you, you have no entrance point to any of the characters in this book. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, like, Macbeth, yeah, we talked about this, like when Lady suggests to Macbeth that they kill Duncan, it literally comes out of nowhere. nowhere. Like it's not even in the middle of a scene. Like we cut, yeah. like they were talking and then we fast forward and it's been a few hours or it's like later that night. And we open the scene with Macbeth being like, what? You said you want me to kill him? What? And then we're like, yeah, what? And she's like, yeah, because then, you know, you can be in charge. And you're like, <laughs> what? <Yeah. laughs> And we were wondering if like some of the transitions were rough because it was a translation. So at first we were going like really easy on it. Cause we're like, maybe it's a translation and some of this we're losing, but even like plot wise, if you were just going to take out that the writing and like, just look at the plot and like motive character motivations, it really doesn't make sense. Like before lady Macbeth, like decide or lady decides to like kill Duncan, I think she was talking about how like she was like losing money in her casino. Like, <laughs> Like she, like the casino was having a tough time economically. So like she wants Duncan dead. So I, and I don't know. <laughs> I mean, her whole like pinch to Macbeth is like, well, cause like they only gave you your position because they want to make it look like the nobodies from the wrong side of the tracks yeah. can have power, but they'll never give you true power. So you have to kill them. So then you'll have power. And I'm like, once again, like it's, it's difficult to translate like a story written with like monarchy and nobility and like birthright into a modern day setting. But this, th this isn't it. <laughs> like at yeah. the very least you have to set it up in some way where like dying and you inheriting that role, position and property, whatever does is that how that works. Yeah. But here, like all of this, like you, you don't like your boss when you're working for the police doesn't die and you inherit his position. Like that's just like not how this works. <laughs> Yeah, I just, I don't get the choices that he made. And he seems to, like, one of his themes seems to be about, like, class warfare because the part of the problem is this town in Scotland, I think, is basically, like, an old coal town, factory town, and it's, like, gone to crap because of bad economics and bad policy and then corruption in the police force. So part of the thrust of Macbeth's, like, um, like his goals is to, like, make the town better but then again, like those motivations just kind of fall flat with everything that he does afterwards. Like if that's the whole point, this idea that he's going to make the town better, why would he work with the drug lord and like kill the? I mean, 
again, all of this backstory doesn't then make up like make sense for the motivations. Yeah, later they on. put in a bunch of backstory where like all of like if you wanted to have like the best friends with Duff thing, like really emphasize not that Macbeth wants to make the town better, but simply that he feels that life has denied him that he and Duff started in the same place, but or didn't, mm -hmm. but kind of, but that like he's been given a raw shake and Duff was handed things on a silver platter and it's, he should be able to have what they have. And so he'll kill everybody because they're, you know, something like that where it's not about making the town better. It's, you know, pure ambition again, which is what drives the original Macbeth. And then it would still make sense that he would be, I guess, pushed to be like, if he like regarded Duff and his like perfect family as like uh, an indictment on Macbeth's own life, that he never had those things. And like, look at his perfect life and something like that. Like it wouldn't be great, but it would be better. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, like in the play, him choosing to kill the king does happen like fast and like sort of out of nowhere. But because you have the supernatural element and like that whole sense of foreboding pushing it, it, it makes a little more sense in the context. And of because that. like it does work that way where if the, yeah. if you're in line to the throne and the people, <laughs> <laughs> that helps. Macbeth, I mean, Macbeth was a soldier, but it's not like he was powerless in the play. Like he was still, it's not like he was like pulled out of the ranks of soldier and given power. He was there already. So, you know, what would a Nesbo fan think of this? Well, I have I heard from, not directly, but just generally, I've heard that people who are fans of Nesbo don't think this is his best work. So I don't think anyone likes this. <laughs> but I think it's hard with the retellings because, like, I tried to read Vinegar Girl, and I had never really heard of the author before, but I had read, like, the Goodreads, and everyone was like, this is not her her best thing. I mean, taking on Taming of the Shrew, like, Vinegar Girl is a retelling of Taming of the Shrew. Which I was excited is about that one, but you've made me very worried. It's a hard play to to make modern and like yeah. still i mean nothing will ever come close to 10 things i hate about you being the perfect shakespeare retelling and if anybody wants my ted talk on that i'm more than happy <laughs> to give it but it does what you say it does that movie can stand alone as like its own movie but if you know that it's a remake of taming of the shrew it makes it more fun and i think that is the way that you make it more modern and vinegar girl they do try to do the same thing as like marrying off like the dad marrying off a sister and it doesn't work in a modern retelling. yeah i think like either you're retelling it to be successful either it has to be willing to be fairly loose and to, to veer off from the play when it has to, to tell a good story, or you do what Margaret Atwood did and literally reference the actual play in the text of your book. <laughs> Which, and I think Margaret Which Atwood- I almost feel like it's cheating, but also she's a good author. I'm like, yeah. I see you, but also it worked, it worked. And and yeah. given that The Tempest is about basically yeah. actors and directors already, then I'm like, if you're gonna do with any of these plays, it's either this or Midsummer Night's Dream and then mm -hmm. I'll forgive you. Yeah. I mean, it is a very meta play to begin with, so you can make a meta book about it. And I think her book falls in what you were talking about, where, um, like, if the, the stages of retellings, you have one that stands alone. I don't know if I would have enjoyed this one if I wasn't already a fan of The Tempest and if I wasn't already a Shakespeare person. So I like, I enjoyed her book because I liked hearing what she, what her perception. Mm -hmm. But I don't like, think it stands on its own. No, I, I mean, I don't know if I... I think you'd be extremely baffled if you had never read The Tempest. If you had never read The Tempest, I think you'd be like, what is going on? But as like a thought experiment about the play, mm -hmm. I think it really works. Like at the end, uh, the characters of the book kind of do a thought experiment about like what would have happened to the play characters in, you know, after the play had ended. And so I think there are very many moments in this book that turn meta and ask you to do a kind of thought play on the play itself and on what Shakespeare was doing and like how that speaks to what the characters in this book are doing. So it's very aware. Whereas the other book. I know it felt less like a novel and more like a novelized dissection of the play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we walk away from that retelling, really understanding what the Tempest is about. So like, or at least what Margaret Atwood thinks it's about. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And just, and I think she does a good job of picking up some of the fun pieces of The Tempest, like um, the prisoners in Hagseed are who you find more interesting, just like in the play, you find the spirits and Ariel, like Ariel is everyone's favorite character in the play. That's just a fact, right? <laughs> like, 
<laughs> it's certainly the most visually interesting in most productions. Yeah. Well, and I think his relationship with Prospero is more interesting than him and his daughters. Like, yeah. It also feels more filial. Yeah. Yeah. Like there is a love there that I find really surprising when I was rereading the Tempest again. Cause I hadn't, like I said before, I hadn't read it in so long. Um, and so I had always like remembered Caliban from the Tempest and. You know, you but, were really upset that there wasn't an actual specific <laughs> Caliban in Hagseed. <laughs> Because Hagseed is Caliban, so by name but they were all book, Caliban. They were all Caliban. Um, but we're all Caliban. You, me, everyone is Caliban. Everyone, we're all monsters, right? Isn't that what is what one of the lines in the play is? Hell is empty, and all the devils are here. Like that's kind of we are all Hagseed. Um, but and I like that she, that she like used words from the play. Um, like she used lines from the play and I think Macbeth does, but like not in a way that's like fun. <laughs> Shakespeare is supposed to be fun. Like it's, he's supposed to be fun. He's supposed to be an entertainer. And that's what I love about Hagseed too, because he makes that whole point to the prisoners. He's like, Shakespeare was meant for you guys. It's not meant for like stuffy old academics. Like Shakespeare is meant for everybody. So. I love the like, explaining to people that this was popular entertainment. This was yeah not regarded as highfalutin which is why i also like to think like a thousand years from now how like reality tv shows like <laughs> will be regarded as like will be dissected in oxford <laughs> <laughs> but um no, i think not. like i know i said this when we were uh buddy reading and chatting about Macbeth, and i stand like the more i've thought about it the more i'm like i'm 100 percent certain of this and now i want someone to write this that like if you're gonna retell Macbeth in a somewhat modern setting, the only way I see it working, if you're gonna do it almost beat for beat, is making it a western. Yeah, because, I said like, mafia, then, like a mafia book, but I think mafia too. But I feel like with the supernatural yeah. elements, it's more likely to work as a western, where like people like because of the harshness of the desert and mm -hmm. and the fact that like you know when people don't have water and they kind of start to see things that may not be there, mm -hmm. and the fact that we get into racist territory, but a lot of Westerns will use like Native Americans as a kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, supernatural or unknown element or whatever. Just yeah. that whole like, and the fact that in, in Westerns, you know, it's kill or be killed. Like the idea that you would inherit power by killing the sheriff or whatever is like kind of more how that would work as opposed to like a really industrialized city where like, that is not how that works. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I really feel like it would work better as a Western. Yeah. 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 I think that would be fun. I think, or, or like it either needs to be like, if you're, if you're going to do it without the fantastical elements, then that could work. Or if you're really going to like lean into the horror elements then it could be like a modern day horror that could get away with that. And so I don't mm -hmm. understand why they chose it. <laughs> I don't know. I just well, like I mean, the authors were given like the, they were asked, I mean, they were offered the chance to choose which play they mm -hmm. want to retell. So clearly Joan Esbo decided he wanted to retell Macbeth. And I'm like, dude. But for why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just makes me so angry. I'm trying to think like, like if I was like, you know, Jonah's Bo's friend and knowing the kind of books that he writes, like if there was a different Shakespeare play that I would like recommend to him as being better for his style. I don't, I can't. Well, if he wants to talk about politics, I mean, the Henry plays are about like, you know. I think, I mean, he writes crime thrillers. So, right. no, it's not really. Nope. <laughs> I don't. Like, I guess I can see why on the surface you'd say, yeah, Macbeth, there's lots of murdering. Mm -hmm. That would be perfect for a crime thriller, but like. <laughs> I mean, if you wanted to do a straight up like revenge one I guess like Hamlet would probably be better because it's not like he's trying to kill his uncle for power he's just trying to do it for revenge mm -hmm. there's that element of trying to figure out if the ghost is right that the uncle did so there's and there's a little bit of detective work <laughs> I mean, you could do a thing where like in, if you wanted to do it straight no supernatural no whatever like something where a recorded video or voice message or something like that is what Hamlet sees or yeah. finds. And like, yeah. there's some reason yeah. to doubt its authenticity. And that's why there's still that element of like uncertainty about whether this happened, but something like that where he thinks he's found evidence. Right. Cause the audience is not always certain that 
the uncle. Well, I guess we kind of believe the ghost, but you know, we're following him. The the play is the thing. It's evidence. That's all the evidence we need. (laughs) (laughs) Well, because yeah, because that's also that that play is also about like people's truths being reflected on their face, and that's also what Macbeth is about. But. Not the book. I don't know what the book's themes were. I guess I like that's real honestly, stuff. like if I was like gonna stop trying to analyze it on like uh, how this retold Macbeth and just try to like review it like I'd review any book right. and for- forget the name, uh, I I don't I couldn't tell you what he was trying to do. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. But all the like, names being exactly the same names, like which again, like it just feels so lazy. Like in in Hagseed, like. His daughter was named Miranda, but he overtly, like, he's a theater director, and he specifically named her after Miranda. Like, he did it on purpose, but everyone else is just named regular names. <laughs> and then he, like, calls people, like, he calls so the prisoner. Joe Nesbo was cursed before he even began. <laughs> Maybe. That's a good one. Yeah, well, and what we liked about Hagseed too is that in one way that it does stand alone as its own book is that by including the prisoners, she also has like, she brings in her own theme about the prison complex, which mm-hmm. feels out like of place, but works, but works in like- Well, her- I mean, as is, I think it, she, she pu- uses Felix as the like vehicle mm-hmm. through which to do this, but she has observed and therefore Felix has observed uh, how many like imprisonings there are in yeah. the Tempest. And he has the prisoners, his students, he has them count and like specifically draws attention to this point, which like in the t- context of the, the the book, it makes sense for Felix to do this. But for Margaret Atwood, it makes sense to have said it in a prison when she was going to be making this point. That was her point was to make this point. Um, so, I mean, it is when you watch The Tempest, you're like, oh, it's this fantastical, magical island of like fairies. And it's basically Midsummer Night's Dream part the second. <laughs> but like when you when that is pointed out to you and when it's retold in the context of of like incarcerated men performing it, that does really draw your eye to the thing that all this whimsy is kind of masking, how everybody is being kind of everyone is in each other's power in one way or another and how they're being controlled and manipulated and how their freedom and their liberty is being um, infringed upon mainly by Prospero, but (laughs) (laughs) yeah. And I, and I really liked that we watched the RSC production of the Tempest and I really liked how they showed um, the ways that Prospero would end the whimsy early. Like there's a lot of whimsy to be had in that, that play. And uh, it, it, that production does a really good job of showing the ways that Prospero ends it. Like if it gets too fantastical, he can't stand it and he kind of shuts it down. And I think that Margaret Atwood does a good job of pulling out the darker undertones of the Tempest and bringing them to the forefront. Like Prospero, you don't necessarily root for him in either the play or the book. You, you know, understand him and you feel bad for him because his daughter and his wife are dead. And like, you know, but you do kind of remember, like, I think she does a, make a point about how she's he's not being great to the prisoners like he is clearly manipulating them and he's lucky that like his play of the tempest ends up working out to his favor and that the revenge ends up working without the prisoners getting punished because this could have had we were both worried while we were reading it that this play was gonna this book was gonna end badly because it seemed to kind of come up against that darkness and then come back from it a little bit and i think it's pointed out in the play but it's not Mm -hmm but it's barely pointed out. It's only pointed out by Ariel, really. Um, Mm -hmm. The the play doesn't dwell on it, but I think the book dwells on how kind of horrifying what Prospero and Felix are doing. Right. Like the fact that they're going to basically torture these people and make them completely lose their minds as vengeance for what, like, yes, it is vengeance. Arguably, I guess, you know, after an eye and justified, like if you say like, well, what was done to me? Like, yeah, that was bad too. But like, when Ariel is the one that's like, I, if you saw how they were suffering, if you saw how horrified they were, I don't think he would go on with this. And yeah. Prospero was like, well, wow, like this non-human thing is affected by this. Can't be affected by it more than me, a human. <laughs> but like, that's really the only time it's pointed out how kind of horrifying and villainous what Prospero yeah. is doing is, how barbaric and how sinister. And mm-hmm. I think this play by putting it in the prison and and even by opening the book, by mm-hmm. kind of showing us how they're freaking out and it's this prison lockdown and they think it's real and it's, it's kind of unsettling and terrifying. And mm-hmm. by putting you more like 
it makes it more visceral. It makes it more apparent how like psycho yes. this, this plan is. <laughs> And all of the prisoners could have had real repercussions mm -hmm. for what they did. And he did not care. And their part. And he did not care that they could end up in, you know, in prison. And, and like, he, one of the prisoners is the one that, they're the ones that constantly say, like, are you sure this is going to end okay? Like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, yeah, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. <laughs> you know, and like giving them, like, false motives to why they should do it you know so and it does end up working out because you know it is a comedy of sorts or whatever but but i do like how the end of the play really brings you up against that like you know did we solve all of the problems um i don't think so and like is this a happy ending like it's a very up in the air like whether or not any of these things are happy endings so because like the prisoners at the end of hags eater most like i think all but one of them is still in prison at the end and feel like i really like, thought that movie because like the book more than the play does it does more to make you see how dark and psycho what he's doing is yeah. I really didn't think it would end well for Felix. Like, no. I really thought he would, I didn't know what would happen. I didn't have a specific thing in mind, but not not a neutral to benevolent ending for him, which is, yeah. I mean, it does mirror the play. In the play, he's kind of, you know, like, well, and you know, let me know what you think. Leave your <laughs> thoughts in the comments down below, Globe Theater. <laughs> it's kind of the end of The Tempest. Um, but like, because like, it just seemed, because we took out the like, plausible deniability of it was magic <laughs> it was like no this is like straight up psychotic behavior that i really thought he would have a like a come to jesus for himself or he would you know maybe kill himself or he would question what he had done or he would really have to face the consequences of that but he didn't it was kind of all fine <laughs> yeah and, and again it's not like everything is wrapped up at the end but yeah it's like that kind of neutral ending where he's not happy but he's not. Dead. He did what he set out to do. He, he accomplished out. his goal, and it worked. He got his revenge, and he got everybody the pieces all where he wanted them. So, and that's kind of the ending of the Tempest. All the pieces are where he wants them, and it's just it's funny because Miranda in the play has such like a naive look on the world because she's grown up on an island and so she's never seen human beings before besides his dad so she's like wow what an exciting world this is and then you end with her dad going well i don't know <laughs> it's kind of not that great of a world like he never forgives his brother it's not like him and his brother in the play have any kind of moment of recognition of what they've done to each other it's just i won't tell the king that you were trying to kill him <laughs> he just like go away for now, <laughs> for now. <laughs> I mean, that was one of the most interesting parts of hag scene was the where each prisoner is meant is is tasked with like coming up with what they think happens next for yeah. their own character like that was mm -hmm. the most fun to me because like you know we've all picked apart the tempest but mm -hmm. well you know or maybe not we all but like that's the thing that's done but it's not, I've never seen anybody be, do that. You know, like, okay, given where we leave off, it is relatively open-ended. Now what? <laughs> where do we see this going? And I, I really enjoyed that part. Yeah. And I liked how the prisoners were like, well, let's look at Caliban. Like, would he really just walk away from all of this grief? Or would he, he try and get revenge again? And what would happen to Ariel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. And I don't even think he goes back to run it. He gives it to he does he like go on a cruise with that woman and then like leaves the theater to the girl who played Miranda and the guy who was in the place of the sun. I don't remember that. He I was like, so upset that he didn't have a bad ending. <laughs> he was like he, he basically says, um, I'm gonna pass the torch to the younger generation. So he more or less gives the theater to the the girl that plays Miranda and like the boyfriend. And then he goes on a cruise, I think with the woman who was. <laughs> well, I know he says that cause like his whole like thing was making this production of the Tempest that he like desperately wanted. But he's like, this one that I did with the prisoners is the best one I'll ever do. Like I low, he don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> like this was it. Like yeah. it's never going to be better than that. And I, got, I did find myself like wishing, God, I wish prisoners did put on play so that we can go and see it. <laughs> that's, 
So. There was a part there. I think I told you this, that it reminded me, I think somebody at some point, uh, I forget who and why, but it's brought up that like, you don't want to do a play that reminds prisoners that they're in prison or whatever, or like the subject oh, yeah. matter being like that. And it just like super reminded me of Johnny Cash, <laughs> like going to the sing for prisoners and being told that he shouldn't sing anything that's going to remind them they're in prison. And he was like, why do you think they forgot? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite, though, is like a more recent example is when Justin Bieber went to the prisons and like sang Lonely. (laughs) But um, we kind of talked about this when we were buddy reading and then like in the interview that I read with Margaret Atwood, she brought a new kind of layer to that. But we were talking about how like Miranda, Ariel and Caliban all represent kind of different lenses through which to view Prospero. Mm -hmm. Um, on a spectrum of like benevolence to to sinister evil and um as she points out which is a is i guess to my shame is not a way that i would have thought about it but that prospero is getting revenge for the fact that he was usurped but arguably he usurped caliban on the island because this was caliban's island and now Mm -hmm. basically prospero did to caliban what was done to prospero Mm -hmm. and prospero himself admittedly was neglectful of his duties back when he was in charge. It's kind of his fault. Yeah. He wasn't good at being a leader. So like, is he a hero that we should root for? Is Caliban really that villainous for wanting what's his back? Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think the thing that makes Caliban kind of monstrous is like what he, what he tries to do to Miranda. Right. Like it, that's always the, but she also said, I mean, I guess there's some speculation as to like whether or not Miranda is as innocent as she seems and whether she just, she knew that that was like a really villainous thing to do and that she would have made that kind of accusation without it being true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, except he does, like, in the play, like, say it again. Like, I wish that I would have succeeded. (laughs) There is that. Oh, there is that. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. I I also think that, like, in the play, like, Caliban follows the drunkards around to, like, show that, like, he's not, like, like, his judgment is not great either. But, I mean, in more ways than just usurping Caliban, he also usurps Ariel's power in a lot of way. Like he takes it for his own. I mean, all of the magic down there is Ariel's, you know? Yeah. I mean, Prospero's like, well, I freed you from that tree. So you yeah. owe me. And he's like, yeah, but for how long? <laughs> like, I remember the first time I read that play, I was like, kept on waiting for Prospero to do something, but it's like always Ariel's magic. So I don't really know. You know, he's I mean, got a he's stick curious. and a cloak. <laughs> 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 Seems magical. <laughs> He waves it around a lot for effect. He puts Moran, he puts people to sleep. He does that. Like, yeah. you know, and he does control Miranda. Like, he controls her entire narrative throughout the whole play. I mean, yeah, honestly, Prosper was, like, kind of scary. Yeah. I mean, he set up that whole thing. Is it Frederick? Is that his name? The prince that she ends up marrying at the end? Oh, uh... Frederick? Sebastian? I don't know. One of those kinds of names. Ferdinand. <laughs> Ferdinand, there you go. So when he know he like guides her into because he knows, oh, this is a young man appearing on the island. Of course she's gonna fall in love with him. So I just love I always love the emphasis in Shakespeare's body, like make sure she's a virgin. Like it's, it's always I mean, I know it's like a thing that happens back then, but I always find it sort of hilarious. I mean, yeah, I think yeah. He's a good dude, but I just, I don't know. I feel like despite him not being a good dude, like I think he's even worse than like we tend to come away feeling, you know, because the play does frame him ultimately as kind of like, he did some questionable stuff, but, you know. <laughs> Whereas like, I feel like if you think individually of all the different things he does and how he goes about doing them, you're like, um, <laughs> I'm kind of terrified of you. <laughs> Well, and I think this is part of what makes it the problem play. What, that's sort of like a horrible definition given to some of Shakespeare's plays. And, and just that it doesn't fit all of these neat categories. But all of his tragedies do the same thing, right? Like, mm-hmm. is Macbeth a tragic hero or is he just a villain? You know, mm-hmm. you think that way about Othello. And so what I think what makes... Uh, the Tempest interesting is that you think that about a comedic character where you're like, it's a good character when like, usually that's what happens in the tragedies. Yeah. 
I would say, I mean, like, there's a lot of things about it that, like, just the fact that he puts Miranda to sleep like that, that is so sinister. That is yeah. so, like, when we talk about, like, he's not gaslighting her, but, like, when we talk about, like, people who have control over, like, their loved ones and who manipulate them in that way, like, that's what that smacks of. And it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. And that whole first speech he gives her about, like, what happened to him, it's very much a manipulation of, like, I need you, because she's sad that he... And the she, fact that he purposely mistreats Ferdinand because he knows, well, then that'll tug at her heartstrings and they'll love each other more because I've created a hardship for them to overcome myself. <laughs> well, and she thinks, like, the first time we meet her, she is upset because she thinks her dad just killed a shipload of people. <laughs> like, she's like, how could you kill all these people? He's like, don't worry, I didn't kill them. I'm just going to torture them for a little bit. <laughs> Oh, it's fine, man. Everything's okay. <laughs> does gaslight her to some degree and does very much take control of her emotions and use them for his own benefit. So, <laughs> Prospero is a traumatizing narcissist. He 100% is. And I almost, I mean, like, uh, his brother is painted as a villain, but like, when you, again, when he was neglectful of his people and we've seen what he's, how he's behaved now, I'm like, do we want him in charge? Yeah. Do we want him to have his position back? But this is why I love the history plays because Henry V is exactly this kind of character. Um, like you could, there are people who write essays, <laughs> essays and essays on whether or not people. Henry V. <laughs> people. <laughs> you people. <laughs> uh, you know, is Henry V a good guy or a bad guy? And like, you could write either way, you know, um, the Kenneth Branagh version tries to make him very much the hero because Kenneth Branagh <laughs> I color me shocked <laughs> yeah but I mean a lot of, I think that's what why I love Shakespeare so much is it really is about like the, those questions that we have about people in general mm -hmm. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I mean that's the thing too though like I think with Macbeth when you were saying how like I mean yeah it's a thing with tragedies more than comedies but like it's more overt to me that the author, the playwright, intends us to regard this behavior as villainous. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Prospero, it's kind of like, and the fact that at the end of the play, even Prospero is like, so what did y'all think of that? <laughs> Please be kind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I think it, I, whenever I teach Macbeth, we always kind of talk about, you know, we see him as this like fallen character, but it's like, do we like Macbeth? Do we root for him? I mean, he is our main, because there are tragedies where you see people doing awful things and you root for them despite I wanting. I don't think we root for Macbeth. I don't think so. But there are other plays like, uh, I don't know if anyone has seen the Revengers tragedy. Um, Christopher Eccleston also does that play. And I suggest everyone go and watch that. But he does some crazy stuff in that movie and some excellent torture. And you do kind of root for him the whole time in a very uncomfortable way. <laughs> and like, well, like, I mean, you brought up Othello. And like, I mean, I think you definitely root for Othello, even though yeah. he does some villainous things. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. And what I really love about Shakespeare is that even though Iago is awful and you hate him, he is also a character that you're drawn to. I mean, this is what, and this is also why we love Henry V because even if we can't agree on whether or not he's a good guy or a bad guy, you cannot help but feel like, like attracted to that character and feel drawn in by him. And that's what Shakespeare does so well is he makes you drawn into these characters who are doing horrible things. Honestly, like, because Othello is my favorite, and I, having read this, I don't want Joe Nesbo within, like, spitting distance of Othello, but <laughs> I almost think that Othello would lend itself more to this, to a crime thriller. Yeah, yeah, because you're trying to figure out whether or not there's, like, a sense And of it's, it's less about, you know, again, like, you don't have to deal with the, like, mm -hmm. if I kill him for his power, but that's not how that works nowadays, this situation, whereas, like, there's none of that. It's all just, I, mean, I don't know why I'm holding this, in Othello, it's all just personal relationships. Like, it's not like Iago kills Othello to get his job. Like, that's like not what happens at all. It's all just like the personal dynamics. And so mm -hmm. you can have, you can tell that story on a spaceship, like <laughs> anywhere that works. Yeah. And Iago does what he does because he can, like he's a bitter, jealous, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> villainous guy. <laughs> so like he does what he can. And there is something I still, that's, you know, still human about that. So 
I think that's really great. One of also just non sequitur. Um, another great play is called Tis Pity, She's a Whore. Again, in a non Shakespeare play that does not get enough love. And it is actually a Romeo and Juliet retelling about brother and sister. And it is one of the most uncomfortable plays to watch because you root for the brother and sister to be together. And then afterwards, you're like, why? Like, why did that play do that to me? I saw Tis Pity in San Francisco and this. It was an amazing production. And I was weeping at the end. And afterwards, I was like, why am I so sad? This is brother and sister. They should not, should not be too good. An example of that in recent memory that I won't say what it is because it'll be spoilery. But there's a recent thing where you're, you're like totally rooting for a brother and sister. And you're like, but why? <laughs> why? <laughs> why? <laughs> I feel like and gross. But that's what I think media, why media is so interesting. Because it does manipulate us. And I think, I mean, that's what The Tempest is about, the ways that the playwright manipulates his audience, right? Shakespeare was very meta, and he was very aware of the power of the play. And so, I mean, he was also indicting playwrights with that, right? Like, I manipulated you yeah, for I mean, out of all the plays, like, Prospero seems the most self-insert character mm -hmm. out of anyone. That Like, this is, especially at the end, that... Prospero's little pitch to the to the audience like yeah. <laughs> think kindly of what I've done here you know set me free that like your judgment is what governs what happens like that's a playwright straight up <laughs> why would Prospero care yeah. <laughs> yeah so I think that's why I find Shakespeare so fascinating because he's endlessly meta in a lot of his plays so I have not watched him oh yeah sorry I'm like reading the comments oh. like, trying to catch up yeah he does intend it and I have seen Tenet. I liked it, which I guess is an unpopular opinion because people did not like Tenet, but I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Kenneth Branagh is like one of those guys that I think is ridiculous, but I still like watch all of his stuff. Well, it's all, I mean, it's a Christopher Nolan movie. It's not a Kenneth Branagh movie. That helps. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he plays the villain, but. I sort of refuse to see Branagh's, um, Praro, because I just couldn't take that seriously. So I, I had, felt like I was refusing to watch it, but then it was, I think it was free somewhere to watch. Yeah. And I was like, ah, I've seen literally every single Agatha Christie adaptation there is, and I've run out. So, okay. And I watched it and I was like, everything else about it is good. Like all the rest of the cast, the cinematography, but Brana as Poro, it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> it physically hurts. Oh my God. The mustache alone is offensive to Agatha Christie. <laughs> Oops. Sorry, uh, there's just also nobody that can be David Suchet. No. <laughs> he no. is Poirot. Just that's it. And so he, I mean, he seemed to be trying to like make it his own, but it, it didn't work. I mean, he has the ego to match Poirot, but he can't. He did not have the grace. <laughs> he like wanted to make him an action hero, which sort of is not the point of Poirot. It's like the worst character to try to do that too. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing that would be even worse would be to try to make Miss Marple an action hero. <laughs> like Granny with her stabbing needles okay. or she's gonna like but I would actually stab you in the eye with her knitting needles. <laughs> I might pay to see Miss Marple the action hero. <laughs> <laughs> Granny in a cat you're in to play to play her. Yeah. So did you ever see Red, the movie Red with Helen Mirren? It's like they're like retired, you know, CIA agents, and she has to like be an action hero. So Helen Mirren also was Prospero. <laughs> that was, I actually liked that one. I didn't like the guy who played Prospero on the RSC, but that production itself is yeah beautiful. everything except Prospero. And he was wasn't a bad Prospero. He was just like by far the weakest part of the production, in my opinion. And I think it goes to show how sometimes all of these elements. Can, can be more interesting than the main character. Like everybody else is more interesting than Prospero. And that's how I felt about Hagseed. Like you're way more interested in the, mm -hmm. I wanted like more from the prisoners. Which is again, another argument for Prospero basically just being a playwright self insert where it's just like, yeah. you just happen to see the playwright on stage doing the directing as which you usually don't see, but like <laughs> that's what he's doing. He's literally yeah. like a playwright directing his own play in real time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Red is campy and fun. I I think you would actually really like that movie. I think you should watch it. It has Morgan Freeman and um, Bruce Willis and Helen Mirren. Those are all, well, for the most part, people that I like. 
Yeah, they're a little bit um... <laughs> retired spies, and so, and they have to like save the world, kind of thing, or themselves. They have to save. Themselves. Oh, did that come out kind of recently? No. Oh. <laughs> oh no, I'm thinking of there's a movie with Ian McKellen where he's like an old spy. No. Maybe. But that's like a serious movie. Yeah. Yeah, this one's campy and fun. It's 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 kind of campy. Ian McKellen is Prospero in the audible version of yeah. The Tempest. And he's, you know, it's Sir Ian McKellen. <laughs> yeah. And Benedict Cumberbatch is Ferdinand. Ooh. Fun. But it did make me think campy reminds me of Macbeth. Because I do part of the <laughs> Campy reminds, reminds you of Macbeth? Yes, <laughs> again, that play is a little campy. Like a lot of those revenging plays from the early 16, 1600s, like if you watch a lot of them, they're, they have a little bit of camp in them because they're over the top. They have that like gothic camp. Like, I don't know if you've read like gothic novels or seen like gothic movies, but they're that little bit of ridiculous. And that's what I, again, I was missing from Macbeth. It doesn't have any of the horror elements, any of that like campy violence. It's like just a police drama. But not a very good police drama. Oh, I can get good. behind a good police drama. That's this is not it. And I think like I don't want to say that it's impossible to make Macbeth a police drama. I think you could do it, but you'd have to like really be engaging more with the themes of Macbeth and less a copy paste of the exact same character names and like kind of the same plot beats, but with a bunch of stuff stuck in between and before to make it not make sense anymore. <laughs> I mean, I, always, I guess I just always think of thrillers and police dramas as like needing a central mystery to keep it going. Mm -hmm. And like, but like Macbeth isn't, doesn't have a mystery. It really is like watching the downfall of these people. And, you know, this idea of like whether or not things are faded or not, or, you know, madness and reason and seeing ghosts and stuff. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> He should not have written it this way. And I have feelings about it. And I could have done better. <laughs> Maybe I would. Also, like, the biggest crime of all is how long this is. Like, if you're going to be a bad book, at least be a short book. <laughs> at least be a short bad book. Like, I just... The audiobook was 17 hours. Yeah. I'm like, what? Like, that's what... Fantasies, I don't know. Made me mad. Maybe. <laughs> So I was like already mad when I started because so I was like, how do you make the shortest play 17 hours? The runtime of the RSC is two hours. It's like just over two hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was getting towards the end and I was like, look, I know it basically ends with Macbeth dying, but I was like, how is he still alive? How is this still going? <laughs> I started to like skim, like skim like the rest of it. And I was like, wait, he's still not dead? Like, what is this? Like, I, again, like, knowing how much is still left, I'm like, all I know, he has to still be alive because it ends with him dying. But, like, but, but why is he still alive? <laughs> how is he not dead yet? Why is he not dead? I also ha was having a hard time finishing Macbeth because I knew what was going to happen to Duff's family. Like, I knew that they were all going to die. And the thing about Shakespeare is, like, some of the more horrific things are always done off stage, and so it, it makes it a little bit more palatable. Like, not everybody's deaths are off stage, but some of the more horrifying things are done off stage, like killing children. <laughs> and, like, this book was not, was doing no backstage things. It was like, here, let me leave nothing to the imagination. I just didn't think that I could. And not in a way that served a great narrative purpose. It just it was... Like, if I'm going to read that kind of tragedy, it has to, like, have meaning. And I was like, this guy is not going to do that well. And yeah, especially the more I think about it, the more, I mean, I'm very pleased that he was not allowed to touch Othello. But the more I think about it, the more I'm like, if you're going to do something like this, Othello works better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there's also, there are a lot of characters in Macbeth, but a lot of them don't need to have backstories and character relationships fleshed out. They just pop in and out to do their thing. And he just took a character sheet from Macbeth and then wrote backstories for each of them and then copy pasted it like into the play of Macbeth, but then changed out all the words to make them modern and ended up with this monstrosity. It's awful. It's so awful. Don't, don't read it. I really want to see, like, if I, I'm sure play. someone likes it. So I need to, like, go on Goodreads or something and find a five-star review to be, like, why? <laughs> what did you like about this? <laughs> I don't think he got that many good, like, I think it got 
more like two and three stars. Yeah, but again, someone somewhere <laughs> gave us five stars. <laughs> five stars. And I someone have questions. Yeah, I have I have questions too. So. But Hagseed. Yeah. A plus. Was- as a retelling, but again, as we've said, like it doesn't really stand on its own. It's more of like uh, a, a critical examination yeah. told in novel form. <laughs> yeah. Everyone should go watch the RSC productions of both of those plays. Yeah. Also, because- all RSC productions of all plays. Of all, the, all, the, all the plays. Yes. And they're not, uh, this isn't anyone's that we read, but they, they did, because uh, there's, you know, some theories that Love's Labor's Lost is like a pre or a like that much do about nothing is a sequel to love's labor's lost Mm -hmm. and so they had the same cast put on both plays back to back um and they're both really really good in fact like i've never really loved love's labor's lost but their production made me love it it, yeah one of my favorite ones is the hollow crown which is like the movies to watch that i have it like i i purchased the digital (laughs) whatever i haven't watched it yet well, when I come out to California, we can do it because it's really good. Also, it's not RSC, but National yeah. Theater taped um, Coriolanus with Tom mm-hmm. Hiddleston. That is Chef's Kiss. Yes, so I mean, and, yeah, yeah, everyone. Oh, oh, actually, that's the that's what Joe Nesbo should have done. Coriolanus. There you go. <laughs> that's bloody AF. He would have had a great time. <laughs> <sighs> We should write him and tell him. <laughs> we should have done this day. You. Why don't people consult us when they do these things? <laughs> we would be the world would be a much better place. Yeah. Now we need to go kill whoever's in charge so that we can have their job. <laughs> and then the world would be a better place. Because <laughs> that's how it works, right? Like, who are you guys? Well, we, you know. We we killed them. There, it's my job now. <laughs> Like, what a weird world. Yeah, it's just, I don't know. So are we ready to do some more Hogarths next month and the month after? Yes. Othello, and, right? Othello is next? I would like to do Othello next. And then I don't, do you want to do a chat like this with two at a time again in like two months? Or do you want to do, we intended to do one just for The Tempest and just for Macbeth. What do you just want? What's do your one. We'll like? do one. Hmm? Just do one. One? One. Like one at a time? Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Othello, it is. I'm. Please don't let me down. At least it's short. <laughs> yeah. Othello has a fascinating production history. So if you want me to talk about that next time, oh, I, I absolutely want you to talk about that. Othello, he has the most fascinating production histories because of the way that people's reaction to it changed over time. So. Well, I mean, just in general, I mean, like seeing uh, Lawrence Olivier play Othello. <laughs> yeah. It's not- yeah, it's not, on bikes. <laughs> it's not it's not great. Yeah. So it has it has a really interesting history. And like and like the original like kind of presence of it was is misunderstood. It's a hard play to to modernize considering how it was thought of back then, but we're not doing all of them. So I don't think all of them are Hogarths yet, right? Like, I don't think all of them. What I've seen is that I think, I mean, originally the plan was to do them all, but they haven't announced a new one in a while. And there is speculation that they kind of gave up on the project, (laughs) unfortunately. But, or fortunately, this was the last one to come out. And maybe they took one look at that and were like, we, no, it's risky. We can't end up with another one of these. (laughs) I think we're going to try and do the Hogarths. The the ones that are out. So like there's, to go though as far as what exists there's new boy which is uh by tracy chevalier which is othello and then you've read it i haven't vinegar girl which is the retelling of taming the shrew there's shylock is my name which is the retelling of merchant of venice there's the gap of time which is a retelling of the winter's tale and there's a lear one um i forget what it's called but there is what a one a retelling of king lear i do love the winter's tale it's one of my I like a lot of things in it, but I don't like the story. Yeah. Like I think some of the best passages and like the best like monologues and whatever are in Winter's Tale, but the story itself is one that like really like it strains credulity. Yeah. <laughs> like well, the yes. end I'm just yes, like coming to life. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> weird, weird one. 
<laughs> but it's one of my favorite productions I saw. But yeah, yeah. Then I think I think the hard part is is just that the Taming of the Shrew is a hard play. In general, it's a hard play to teach. It's a hard play to talk about. I mean, it is just. I mean, you know glamorizes abuse and the only reason why like i saw the um elizabeth taylor and oh gosh what's the guy richard burton yeah i saw their movie and the only reason that movie works is because those characters have amazing chemistry because if you take away it's i mean they have such great chemistry on screen which is why they were so famous so they make the movie work but it is such a awful play to sit through (laughs) and like it keeps hard you mean in general is an awful play to sit through or like that their version of it is? No, the play in general is an awful play as a modern human being to sit yeah. through. But the, uh, their movie you can watch because they have such great chemistry. The theater that we have season tickets to down here, um, they did Taming the Shrew a few years ago and I really liked their production of it. I think yeah. their you interpretations have- helped to yeah. help <laughs> the situation. Yeah. 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 <laughs> glamorizing abuse <laughs> you know yeah, which i mean a lot of it can't like you can't change i mean i guess you can change the text but if you're not going to change the text like you can do a lot through the in, like the inflection and through the stage direction to like yeah. imply things as being meant humorously rather than seriously you know what i mean like not a real like that it. yeah doing things like that to make it like through body language make it more equal yeah. And if you have a good, you know, cast who can like do that thing that Elizabeth Burton and Richard Taylor, or, yeah, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton did, which is like create that kind of chemistry that makes you believe it's okay that they end up together. Mm-hmm. Like if, if you can do that with your main actors, it, it works. That but. same theater they did, they've done Othello a few times, but then their most recent production, they had it take place on kind of like an army base. So everyone was like in camo and mm-hmm. Amelia is like, basically without being said explicitly that's what she is but the way to have like a handmaiden she's just like a, like a sergeant who's like on base and a female so like Othello's like hey can you like help her out like while she's here um <laughs> so like that's how that works but the the way that they had Ophelia not Ophelia sorry Desdemona um I feel like more often than not I've seen Desdemona played very demure and very like sweet and shy and innocent this mm-hmm. Desdemona was very not that she was like her and Othello we seemed very much closer in age and very much close. Like they seemed like a marriage of equals where mm-hmm. they were very much in love with each other, but she was like quite confident and quite sorry. Sirens. <laughs> well, just so it's not silent, I was just going to say that like, and I don't, and I think this is part of the interesting production of Othello, the production history is like watching both of those characters change with the times. And I don't think that the original Desdemona was supposed to be demure. Like if she was, then Othello wouldn't be able to buy Iago's story about her. Part Mm -hmm. of what makes Othello buy the the, the Iago's story is that Desdemona is very charismatic and she does Mm -hmm. like say what she wants. That's why she insists on going Mm -hmm. with them. Like mm-hmm. on Terry Tor. So she's but I've also so I've seen like some Desdemonas where she's played to be like overly like just flirtatious. Oh, and yeah. Where, yeah, and then you're like, well, that's why he thinks that because she's just like this big old flirt. And right. like this wasn't like that. She was very, yeah. as you say, very charismatic and very mm-hmm. confident and very like her own woman. And like the way that the body language between the two of them felt very much like of equals, where they're very mm-hmm. much in love with each other and very like into each other and yeah, so like I, I really enjoyed that interpretation of both characters because like it gets a bit icky when it's too very. I've seen somewhere like Othello is clearly a lot older and she's very sweet and demure, and you're like, this is very like dad and daughter vibes, and you're like, Ooh. and that's kind of what the Victorian era did to her. Like the Victorian era was obsessed with Ophelia and Desdemona and made both of them like very demure like weekend versions because that's you know victorian era that's what they that's what they did so they were but like that era just like the like the painters and everybody were very obsessed with those two characters and very obsessed with their deaths and making their deaths very did you watch stage beauty yet no i haven't i need to for everyone else stage beauty is a movie about when women were finally allowed to be on stage and a male actor who had been playing women doesn't know how to act as a man and he doesn't 
think that women can do women as well as he can. And he's having like this massive identity crisis because he's always played women and there's a way to play women and women don't know how to play women, <laughs> but they mainly use Othello as like the play, the through line that like he was famous for dying beautifully as Desdemona. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very good movie. And if anybody wants to know, that's kind of what my dissertation was on this like idea of these sexualized and beautiful <laughs> deaths so i have a whole chapter on desdemona i find that play fascinating so <laughs> well next month when we talk about new boy and othello we'll have by then you should have watched stage beauty i will <laughs> no, I, that'll be part of my homework this month is watching that watching another production of othello yeah i'm excited to watch the rsc production of othello i haven't seen that yeah I'm and sure then somebody thinks that the National Theater production was great, so I'll have to add that to my... But those are harder to find. Like, they usually only do... Like, you're usually only able to see National Theater productions in the cinema. Like, yeah. when they especially when they do, do it. And then, like, during COVID, for a few months, they were, like, a play a week were putting them on YouTube, so you could, for free, yeah. stream it, but just for that one week. But, like, they're not... There's you can't even like pay to like buy a DVD or anything like there's literally you can't watch it unless you're in like in the cinema when they happen to be showing it. The companion book for Othello is called New Boy by Tracy Chevalier. Yes, Stage Beauty is good. And Billy Crudup is the male actor playing women and Claire Danes plays his like costume his seamstress and she's the first actress to be an actress. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna definitely gonna put that on my on my homework this week. And I'll be in California in like two weeks. So yeah. where it's hot. But yeah, there's a protest going on outside my window today. And like I even got an alert on my phone during this live warning me that there's a public safety alert because there's an unlawful assembly right outside my window <laughs> I'm like yeah no i'm aware <laughs> when are we discussing at the end of august, end of august. ish <laughs> <laughs> time is tbd <laughs> since we just decided like now that this was yeah. <laughs> officially a worst case scenario we'll do what we did now and push it to the end of september when we'll talk about that and whatever the other play was <laughs> <laughs> maybe next time yeah so yeah. So yeah. This, yeah. this was fun. And if Final anybody thoughts other should... than don't ever read Macbeth, but <laughs> yeah. do read Macbeth. <laughs> oh my god, the amount of times when I show people my TBR list, um, like not like a stack of books, but just like written down my list, and I had Macbeth and Macbeth, and they're like, Well, you don't need two Macbeth. So I'm like, <laughs> but. <laughs> but I do. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, these were good. These we can recommend. Mm -hmm. And the play, just Shakespeare, yeah. And if, you, and if you have any Shakespeare questions, send them send them to me for next time. Yeah, I don't, I have meant to, and I might not have, so I'll update it, but I'll have your Instagram in the description. Yeah. So people yeah. can come harass you. Yes. You can harass me about Shakespeare all you want, but then I might just give you homework and then send you to read some non-Shakespearean plays from that time. <laughs> Don't get Maybe that's what we should do too. Just like I'll make you a list of like non Shakespeare plays that you must watch, and then we can talk about them here. Well, I'm making you watch Stage Beauty, so it's that's only true. fair. Yeah, that's true. We could watch the Christopher Eccleston Revenger's Tragedy. I love Christopher Eccleston. I watch pretty much anything that he's in. Eddie Izzard's in that one. It's kind of. Oh, it's I love Eddie Izzard. Yeah, you already have me interested. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for inviting me on your Oh, my trip. absolute pleasure. Thank you for loving Shakespeare. But also, <laughs> like, how could you not tell me all this time that we've been talking about Shakespeare all these years? <laughs> Usually people aren't impressed with that. <laughs> I'm so impressed. <laughs> so this has been an absolute delight. Usually I'm like, so Shakespeare, and people are like, oh, he's he wrote Romeo and Juliet, right? And I'm like, <sighs> <laughs> So this has been an absolute delight. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.